Good evening. Good evening. Glad that you could be here tonight. Appreciate you being with us. We are tackling our question and answers tonight, and tonight we are dealing with a question that uh, may be one that you've dealt with in the past and dialoguing with different folks and things of that nature. Uh, just uh, in case you're new to the question and answer night, we do take uh, try to take one night every two months uh, to take some time to answer questions that you may have in your study, things that you may uh, pique your interest, maybe questions that you have as you study through different texts or different passages. We want to take nights like tonight to try to field different questions and try to help us all grow together in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. What we want to do is to make sure that people are aware that we do have a question box. That question box is in the middle for you. Uh, there are little cards on the side of that question box. Feel free to put a question on that or hold it up on a sheet of paper. You can also email questions in, uh, send them by Facebook to me if you want, or send them to my personal email or to the church email, and they'll all get funneled through, and we'll try to address them in a, in a reasonable fashion. Tonight's question deals with this question concerning the speaking of tongues. Uh, how do we have a uh, biblical discussion with someone who believes speaking in tongues still happens? Well, that's a great question, wonderful question. And when we talk about a question like this, um, how do we have this discussion? There may be an aspect to this discussion on how do we engage in a topic that may be a bit uncomfortable for us, maybe a bit uncomfortable for them, maybe it's an area of disagreement. How do we have such a, a conversation in, in, uh, uh, regarding topics like this? When we think about uh, individuals who believe that speaking in tongues still exists today, what we're largely talking about is individuals that are of the Pentecostal persuasion. When you look at the numbers of people in, uh, in that faith, they would fall in terms of people that would uh, uh, have some belief in Christianity. It's estimated that there are one billion Roman Catholics throughout the world. Uh, second behind them are a group of individuals known as the Pentecostals. It's estimated that their numbers are right around 622 million. And so it's a, it's a massive group of people. Uh, Baptist churches would fall in around 100 million. So uh, a, a great number of folks uh, um, ascribe to those beliefs. Sometimes people will, uh, will say, you know, we are a full gospel church. And what they mean by that is they believe that all this, uh, uh, perhaps what they mean by that is that all the, the spiritual uh, gifts in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14 are still uh, going on. And, uh, and one of those being that gift of speaking in tongues. When you run into questions like this and you're having conversations with this, it's always good to back up and say, okay, where is there some common ground? You look at the book of Acts, and when uh, Paul went to the city of Athens, the city was given fully to idolatry. It provoked uh, Paul, and when Paul saw the city fully given to idolatry, he did notice that they were a very religious people. He didn't share the same beliefs with them. They were engaged in idolatry, and so he would use a common ground, that is, the fact that they're religious, he would use that as a common starting point. So where might you begin such a conversation? Well, it's good to stop and back up and say, okay, where are we on the same page with people of this persuasion? Well, people of the Pentecostal persuasion would certainly believe in the, the triune nature of God and God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. They would certainly believe that the Bible is inspired. Uh, they would uh, uh, believe in the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, just like we would. Uh, they would believe in the importance of worship, things of that nature. They would believe in the necessity of faith and things of that nature. So there is some common starting points in having uh, such a discussion. And so we want to start with some common ground, but also understand that, that we may have many religious friends and neighbors, uh, people in our families, co-workers, uh, uh, people that we come in contact with at the grocery store and things like that, where where we may have some areas of common ground, but it's also significant in, in, in our study of the gospel that we understand, hey, that there are some differences too. 
and that we don't back away or shy away from those differences, that, that we really want to talk about those things. We really, really want to be an open book and that we really want to be people that are of the book. And so nothing we would love more than to let's sit down and, and let's open this up and let's read what does, because at the end of the day, what's going to settle the matter is not who has the greatest numbers of people who ascribe to a certain belief, but what does this actually teach? What does this actually say? How do I become a most faithful follower of Christ that I possibly can? So when there are areas of disagreement, I realize that sometimes that confrontation is uncomfortable. And I'm not saying that, that, the, that the time is to really uh, dig in and, and, uh, and get, your, get your boxing gloves on and have the best uh, argument you can over the issue. But what I'm saying is that let's you and I sit down and, and discuss, okay, What's going to determine what the truth is on this matter? It may be obvious that we don't share the same beliefs, but how do we come to a reasonable conclusion? Both us and Pentecostals would certainly appreciate what happened in Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost. And they would, they would align themselves with, with those things that happened on the day of Pentecost. And so we want to to uh, find out how we might find some common ground. In examining our beliefs, there's nothing wrong with us stopping and testing them. How are we going to test them? 1 Thessalonians 5.21 says, But test everything, hold fast what is good. 1 John chapter 4 and verse 1 says, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. So if the Bible is saying that it's incumbent upon us to test everything, if the Bible is saying that it is incumbent upon us that we are to test the spirits, what is to be the standard? What will be the, the threshold for saying, you know what? I think your belief is right. I need to go along with that. Or what will be the standard for saying, you know, I think this belief surely deviates from what from a standard. What will that standard be? Well, in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16 and 17, the Bible says, All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, watch this, equipped for every good work. Scripture, all scripture, equips a person for every good work. So, if I'm contemplating, does the speaking of tongues happen today? Paul makes a statement that scripture will inform me on whether that's something in keeping with the will and the word of God or not. So here's what I do. I go on a scripture hunt. And let's open this together. And let's follow the truth wherever it may lead. And that's what we want to do. How will we examine these beliefs? We will, we will uh, compare them with scripture. So... There are various viewpoints about uh, script, uh, the tongues that exist in the New Testament. If you will, turn your Bibles to Acts chapter 2 for just a moment. And I want you to notice this occasion uh, in just a moment. We're going to be reading there. But I want you, before we get there, to realize that there were some promises made about speaking in tongues. Now, there are two different viewpoints in the world tonight concerning the speaking of tongues. Some believe that these are ecstatic utterances, meaning like joyful utterances, that are unintelligible. That is, that they're not understood. In other words, they're, they're uh, something that would be spoken where the individual who might be uh, professing such a, a, a language may put it out there and it may be heard, but, but only God understands it. Um, is that what scripture is talking about when it talks about speaking in tongues? Now, if you were to look in Mark chapter 16 and verse 17, it says, And these signs will accompany those who believe. In my name they will cast out demons. They will speak in new tongues. Mark chapter 16 and verse 17. Jesus in John 14 verse 16 and John 15 and John 16 as well will promise the Holy Spirit. And then in Luke, Luke chapter 24 and 49, uh, verse 49 says, And behold, I'm sending the promise of my Father upon you, but stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. So 
Jesus tells the apostles to wait in Jerusalem till they receive the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, what we read in the beginning of Acts is Jesus ascends to heaven. The apostles are waiting in Jerusalem. Ten days after his ascension, they receive that power. And that's what's happening in the, uh, in the beginning of the book of Acts. In Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, the text says, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. One more preliminary matter before we jump into Acts chapter 2. And that is, what exactly was the purpose of speaking in tongues? Was it to show people that, hey, I have this special gift that, hey, uh, uh, everybody, look at me. I'm speaking in a language I never studied. And God, God is, is it about drawing glory to the person who, who is uttering the language? Or was it about something else? You see, in these gifts that God gives, even when we look at Paul uh, and, and the healings, and we look at Peter, and we look at Jesus, um, spiritual gifts weren't always there as just, hey, uh, um, I need this extra help. I'm struggling with my help. Um, can you call this guy? It wasn't just a, a, an automatic fix if you knew him, if you came in contact with him. There was a, a deeper spiritual message with, with some of these healings and the nature of some of these gifts. In John 20, verse 30 and 31, the Bible says, Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples which are not written in this, in this book. That is, the signs of Jesus. But, verse 31, these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ. The signs were to lead to faith, that is, trust and belief and obedience in Christ, believing that Jesus is the Christ. What's that mean? It means that Jesus is the anointed one of God. So the signs, uh, you know, Nicodemus in, in John chapter 3 came to Jesus by night, and, you know, uh, he, was, he was amazed because no one could do these things unless he was from God. And so you see that here is a religious man who understands that, hey, People can't do these things unless God is with them. And Jesus has this uh, engagement with Nicodemus. So it's leading to belief. In 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 12, So with yourselves, since you are eager for manifestation of the Spirit, strive to excel in building up the church. So the purpose of the speaking of tongues was not to draw glory to the man. It was to reveal a message to people who lacked the understanding and the ability to, to speak certain languages. When we are in Costa Rica, my Spanish is very small, right? Um, I like pictures. Uh, and so we need an interpreter, right? And uh, some of the interpreters are very fluid, English to Spanish, Spanish to English, it's like it's one language for and we were blessed to work with some of those when we were in Costa Rica, but I would limp uh, uh, very heavily through a sermon if I was supposed to speak it in Spanish. It might be really, really short. Uh, uh, so uh, speaking in, uh, in tongues, in Acts chapter 2, uh, I want you to see in verse 4, and let's just follow through the tongue. So what would I recommend to a person who has a friend or a neighbor or a loved one and they're they want to discuss this. I would recommend opening up the Bible and saying, hey, would you mind if we read some verses together? Let's see, let's see what these tongues are in the first century. And then as we move from what those tongues are in the first century, then we can ask the question, do they exist in fact today? In Acts chapter 2 and verse 4, they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So here's the Spirit enabling people who have not learned these languages to speak them. What were some of those languages? Well, if you were to look in the book of Acts, uh, you would see that there were Jews gathered in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost that have come as far for, uh, as Rome, right? Uh, Rome would be uh, in the west. And then you would have individuals that have come from Africa. You would also have individuals that have come from the east. It would be a melting pot there. It's a major Jewish feast day, and uh, it's on the day of Pentecost. Multiple languages, multiple people, 
all there for this uh, Jewish feast and celebration. Now verse 5, now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. Verse 6, and at this sound, the multitude came together, and they were bewildered because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. And they were amazed and astonished, saying, are not all those who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each one of us in his own, watch this, native language? What is a tongue in Acts chapter 2? It's somebody's native language. It's someone, it's not a, an utterance that's unintelligible. It's not an utterance that, that nobody understands. It's it, language, when we think about what language is, it's a communication between two minds. Language is a, is a medium, you know, for, for me to speak and for you to understand there is this medium that, that's coming through in English to you that, where, whereby you can comprehend. It's the union of two minds via, uh, uh, via words, sentences, and uh, all the dynamics that are in those constructions. <clears throat> uh, so they were amazed. And at verse 9, Parthians and Medes and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians, we hear them telling in our, watch this, own tongues, the mighty works of God. Now they realized that the ones that were speaking this were not native, right? They weren't, this wasn't their hometown. Aren't these Galileans? But we're understanding in our own language. And all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others mocking said, they are filled with new wine. So, <clears throat> They were speaking in, there's no doubt when you read Acts chapter 2, that you see that what the tongues are, are certainly languages that are understood. It's not just an unintelligible uh, thing. Now, when we get over into 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 12, I want you to turn there for just a moment. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And I would recommend this. We're going to do some extensive reading here, but I want you to see that the text really answers this question. Um, what exactly are tongues? And the, the major chapter on this issue is 1 Corinthians chapter 14, but I want to make sure that we hit some things before we get there. We might ask this question, does the Bible say that people don't speak in tongues today as given the power by God? In other words, are there people that that if they wanted to learn uh, Mandarin, former Chinese, uh, that they wouldn't have to study, that God would give them the, pa the power if a person wanted to study biblical Greek, would God simply give them that gift? If a person wanted to speak biblical Hebrew, could God just give them that gift? Or on and on you could go with Spanish and German and French and different languages. Is God empowering people to speak like he did then? That's the question that's on the table. And the Bible certainly answers that. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 7, to each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. Notice that these spiritual gifts in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 are for the common good. For to one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom and to another the utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by the one Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another, the ability to distinguish between the uh, spirits. To another, various kinds of tongues. To another, the interpretation of tongues. All these are empowered by one and the same spirit who apportions to each one individually as he wills. When we look in a time when the New Testament was not complete, if a person showed up, if a teacher showed up in a geographical area in Philippi, in Ephesus, in Laodicea, in Corinth, in Rome. How would you know whether that teacher was telling the truth or not? In the absence of a written final revelation, you could compare what they're teaching with the Old Testament. You could also see that the Spirit is enabling. Paul is teaching the same thing in every church that he goes to. It's not one faith for one congregation or different faith for another. He's teaching the same thing in every place that he goes. Now, let's drop down, look at verse 10. 
to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another the ability to distinguish between spirits, and to another various kinds of tongues. Uh, and then we read there to the interpretation of uh, tongues. And so the Spirit is working in all of those to, to bring about the truth that God wants revealed to people. Remember, Jesus said that the Holy Spirit would come and guide them into all truth. And so here is a, some practical uh, aspects to it. In 27 of chapter 12, notice the text. Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. And God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, uh, helping, administrating, and various kinds of tongues. Notice that here are spiritual gifts, and here are individuals who are using those spiritual gifts. Verse 29, he says, chapter 12, are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, do all work miracles, do all possess gifts of healing, do all speak with tongues, do all interpret, but earnestly desire the higher gifts, and I will show you a still more excellent way. Well, Paul, what do you mean by that? Well, let's let the text answer it. In chapter 13 and verse 1, Paul launches in now to a discussion about love. He says, if I speak in the tongues of men and of angels but have not love, I'm a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. Here again, he's talking about the manner in which tongues ought to be uttered. They're to be uttered in a, in a lovely way, in a loving way. Now skip over to chapter 14 and notice verse 1 of the text. He says, pursue love and earnestly desire the spiritual gifts, especially that you may prophesy. Now remember, Paul is writing to the church at Corinth, right? Uh, is there a time element to this? Um, does this apply to you and to I? Should we be desiring the spiritual gifts? That's the question that's on the table. Let's let the text answer that. Verse 2, for one who speaks in a tongue speaks not to men but to God. For no one understands him, but he utters mysteries in the spirit. On the other hand, the one who prophesies speaks to people for their upbuilding and encouragement and consolation. You know, I want you, I want you to understand that there is this contrast, this comparison and contrast that is going to weave its way through chapter 14. I want you to notice that. I want you to pay particular attention to it. Should I desire to prophesy or should I desire to speak in a tongue? Paul's going to address that. He's going to compare the two uh, as he weaves it through the text. Verse 3, on the other hand, the one who prophesies speaks to people for their upbuilding and encouragement and consolation. The one who speaks in a tongue builds up himself, but the one who prophesies builds up the church. Now, I want you to all speak in tongues, but even more to prophesy. The one who prophesies is greater than the one who speaks in tongues, unless someone interprets so that the church may be built up. What's the big picture, Paul? Hey, we want you, when you come together, we want it to be for the common good. We want you, when you come together, not just to be, to, to, to be one or uh, just a handful of people that are being encouraged, being edified, being built up in the faith. We want the entire body to be built up. And so he tells them that, and draws this comparison. Now, verse 6, chapter 14. Now, brothers, if I come to you speaking in tongues, how will I benefit you unless I bring some revelation or knowledge or prophecy or teaching? If even lifeless instruments such as the flute or the harp do not give distinct notes, how will anyone know what is played? Notice the, the analogy there. If an instrument is just, if a person is untrained on an instrument, and they just start blowing notes, right? Um, I mean, it's it's noise, right? But it's not music. Um, but when they understand melody and harmony and, and how to use that instrument to bring about something beautiful. So he's drawing this analogy saying that, hey, that there are, there are some things that I want you to think about in the use of tongues, verse 8, and if the bugle gives an indistinct sound, who will get ready for battle? So when the bugle cries, it's important if, if the military is going to act that the people know what the sound is and what it means. And if a person doesn't know how to play, uh, know how to 
use the bugle, there'll be a problem for the army, uh, and there'll be a problem in protecting people. So, verse 9, with yourselves, if with your tongue you utter speech that is not intelligible, how will anyone know what is said? You catch it? If you're uttering a language that no one understands, who will get it? Who will know? Who will understand? How will it build up the body? How will anyone know what is said? For you will be speaking into the air. There are doubtless many different languages uh, in the world, and none is without meaning. But if I do not know the meaning of the language, I will be a foreigner to the speaker, and the speaker a foreigner to me. So with yourselves, since you are eager for manifestations of the Spirit, strive to excel in building up the church. What's he saying? He's saying, listen, this idea, uh, the tongues have their place. But in a collective body in the assembly, I want you to know that, hey, I would rather everybody be built up together in God's sight. Strive and build it up. Verse 13, therefore, one who speaks in a tongue should pray that he may interpret. For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, my, uh, my, uh, but my mind is unfruitful. What am I to do? I will pray with my spirit, but I will pray with my mind also. I will sing praise with my heart, but I will sing with my mind also. Otherwise, if you give thanks with your spirit, how can anyone in the position of an outsider say amen to your thanksgiving when he does not know what you're saying? Do you see what he's getting at? How's a person going to amen if they don't understand the very words that you're uttering? And one of the most beautiful things in Ghana is to listen to them sing. The Africans sing with their mouths wide open. And it's beautiful. The baritones and the harmony. and it, it, It's wonderful. But you know what? When I'm in Africa, I don't know what they're singing to God. I can tell you that the harmony and the melody are beautiful, but, but I don't know what they're saying. How can Paul is making this point? He's making this point. How can we say amen if we don't know what's being said? Verse 17, for you may be giving thanks well enough, but the other person is not being built up. You see that there's, there, with intelligible languages, with languages that are understood, if there's going to be mutual edification, mutual, mutual building up, it's important that both uh, that people in the assembly, that they be able to speak the same thing. Now look at verse 20. Brothers, do not be children in your thinking. Be infants in evil, but in your thinking be mature. In the law it is written by people of strange tongues and by lips of foreigners will I speak to this people. And even then they will not listen to me. But uh, uh, says the Lord, verse 22, Thus, tongues are a sign not for believers, but for unbelievers, while prophecy is a sign not for unbelievers, but for believers. If, therefore, the whole church comes together and all speak in tongues and outsiders or unbelievers enter, will they not say that you are out of your minds? But if all prophecy, excuse me, if all prophesy and an unbeliever or outsider enters, he is convicted by all. He is called to account by all. The secrets of his heart are disclosed. And so, falling on his face, he will worship God and declare that God is really among, among you. Verse 26. What then, brothers, when you come together, each one has a hymn, a lesson, a revelation, a tongue, or an interpretation. Let all things be done for building up. If any speak in a tongue, let there be one, uh, excuse me, let there be only two, or at most three, and each in turn, and let someone interpret. But, watch this, underline it in your Bible, but if there is no one to interpret, let each of them keep silent in church and speak to himself and to God. So let's say, for example, that a person was actually empowered by the Spirit to speak in a language that they've never studied. If no one else understands that language, what does Paul say that they must do? Paul says that they must keep silent. So when we think about modern practices, it's important to weigh modern practices in light of these verses. Verse 29, let two or three prophets speak and let the others weigh what is said. If a revelation is made 
to another sitting there, let the first be silent, for you can all prophesy one by one so that all may learn and all uh, be encouraged and the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. Now, look at verse 36. Or was it from you that the word of God came? Or are you only are you the only ones uh, ones it has reached? If anyone thinks that he is a prophet or spiritual, he should acknowledge that the things I'm writing to you are a command of the Lord. If anyone does not recognize this, he is not recognized. So, my brothers, earnestly desire to prophesy and do not forbid speaking in tongues, but all things should be decently and in order. Now, what is Paul saying? He's writing to the church in Corinth. He's regulating because he doesn't want when the assembly happens, there are certain uh, Corinth at this time is plagued by chaos in their assembly. What do I mean? There's chaos going on with the Lord's Supper. One person is hungry. Another person is drunk. Um, th there's chaos going on in the assembly in Corinth. And so this chaos extends now into uh, spiritual gifts where where God would be trying to build up the people. Paul is saying, hey, you know, let's let's streamline this so that the whole body can be built up. Notice it's written to a particular people at a particular time for a particular purpose, dealing with some specific instances that are going on in that congregation. Now, look at First Corinthians 13. First Corinthians 13. <clears throat> If you were to ask this question, do I know from Scripture that the ability to be empowered by the Spirit today, do I know that that does not take place? Do I know that the Bible does not support that? Do I know that there are, in fact, passages that teach that this doesn't happen anymore? There are. 1 Corinthians 13 is that text. Now look in verse 1. If I speak in the tongue of, tongues of men and of angels but have not love, I'm a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith that's so, uh, so as to remove mountains but have not love, I'm nothing. What's Paul saying? Paul's saying that with the spiritual gifts, there must be a, a spirit of love and building up. And then he's going to go in, uh, into this great discussion on on love in 1 Corinthians 13. Now look at verse 8. Love it never ends. As for prophecies, watch this, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. What's the contrast there? The contrast is between the temporary and the permanent. Love never ends. Partial prophecies, they're going to end. Tongues, they'll cease. Partial knowledge, it's going to pass away. Watch verse 9. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. How do we know that it's partial? That it's not the full, complete revelation? You see, by, by the time you get to the book of Jude, here, Jude 1, verse 3, the faith is once for all delivered. Right? You've got a complete body of information. But what he says, we know in part, we have partial knowledge and we prophesy in part. We have partial prophecy. But when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. Partial knowledge, uh, partial uh, gifts, they're temporary. But here is the perfect. When the perfect comes, what is the perfect? Is the perfect Jesus? Is this talking about the second coming of Christ? Well, Jesus is not uh, and when you look at the original language here, this is not a he. This is a that. Uh, this is, uh, in the Greek, it would be what would be called neuter. It's not, it's not uh, gender. It's not male. It's not he. It's when the perfect comes, when that which is perfect is come. And so there's this contrast between the, the temporary and the permanent, between the partial and the complete. Notice the text. When the par perfect comes, the partial will pass away. So we can rule out Christ because Jesus is a he. He's not a that. Uh, verse 11. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. But when I became a man, I gave up childish ways. What's Paul saying? That when the church is in, a, in spiritual infancy, there was this necessity for spiritual gifts. 
but there's coming a day when the partial is going to go away. And that's when the perfect has come. What, in fact, is the perfect, Paul? Well, here's another in comparison, verse 12. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. So, so you've looked into a mirror, you've ever been in the bathroom, and the, the shower is steamed up, and you can't really see. You kind of can make out some things, but you can't see really clearly. But there's coming a day and a time when Paul can see clearly. So how do we know? Different translations will say that which is perfect, as the King James says, or as the New English translation, what is perfect, or as the ESV, ESV says, the perfect. Now, this is not a he or a him, but this is a completion, a, a, an end that's coming. It is my belief and it's my contention that what this perfect is, is the complete revelation of Jesus Christ. That it's the it's 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 this teaching. You've got partial knowledge, partial knowledge from Peter. You got partial knowledge from Paul. You got partial knowledge from the Hebrew writer. You got partial knowledge from from John in his five writings that we have. You got all these partial knowledge. You've got Luke who's recording partial knowledge from from multiple individuals, from from Silas and from Timothy and from Titus. And you read through the book of Acts and you have uh, records of sometimes Luke is there. You have all these wee passages in the book of Acts. Luke is, is there observing these with his own eyes, and he's recording them as a historian, uh, uh, writing this book to, to Theophilus so that he could have certainty concerning the things that are written. You see that, that uh, uh, the perfect, what makes sense here is that, that it's the complete body of doctrine. How do we know that speaking in tongues don't occur today? Well, because... Colleges are, are full of people taking languages because they don't know them. And multiple apps now, Babel is one of them, uh, 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 apps that are out there trying to teach people other languages. And uh, uh, these are languages that are understood. In, in Acts chapter 2, it's a native language that's understood. In 1 Corinthians 14, these are languages that are spoken that are meant to build a people up. And in 1 Corinthians 13, we can know with certainty that that these languages and this ability given by the Spirit, not that people can't speak in other languages, but that the ability of being empowered by the Spirit to do these things has now passed away. I hope that this has answered your, the question tonight. If you have follow-up questions to that, please uh, let me know. And um, if you want just some personal explanation on that, uh, when we talk about uh, this idea of tongues, what we see in that is that when the Spirit gave this power in the first century, that it's been described by, by some one commentator in particular that this was kind of the reversal of the Tower of Babel. In the Tower of Babel, you remember the languages are confused. In Acts chapter 2, all those different languages are understood. It happened by the Spirit. God was enabling that ability. If you're here tonight and you're not a Christian, we want to encourage you to become one. You can by following the pattern in the Bible. By hearing the word of God, believing it, repenting of your sins, confessing the name of Jesus, being buried in the watery grave of baptism. This will allow you to become a disciple, a follower of Jesus. And if it is the case that tonight you haven't done that and you decide, you know, tonight is the night. I want to unite with my Lord and my Savior. I'm going to put my life, my future in his hands. I want to be his child. He'll save you tonight. If you desire to do that, if you're not a child of God, you want to be baptized tonight. We want to help you with that. We want to invite you as we sing this song of invitation to make yourself available for that. And maybe you already are a child of God, but you would like the church to pray for you and with you. 